Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. We live in a rare asset world, right? Because valuations throw them out the window. Like yeah. seriously, like you can't, if someone starts to talk about fundamentals with me, I'm like, are you fucking insane? So we've lost, the script is gone. Um, and in, so in a world where there is no script and the government's printing money and no one wants to be poor and they print their money, you have to assume this is now embedded, fixed into the system. Like interest rates will rise based on nothing that's in the textbooks because they're not stopping what they're doing. Uh, We're screwed, Um, but here we are. So in that world, uh, anybody who talks fundamentals, I don't know, it's it's a greater fool theory at this point and you have to have a good thesis and you have to have great money management. And so I believe in this rare asset thing and there's a certain amount of companies with rare assets. Hi, everyone. I'm back from my break, 10 days in Montana. Uh, and we've got a guest on today who knows a thing or two about hiking and biking up mountains uh, when not picking out the next tech winners or starting his own companies. We've got Howard Lindzen on today. He's the founder of Stock Twits, CEO of Social Leverage, and much, much more. Welcome, Howard. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Um, you're in Coronado today? I am. It's another nice day. I am home alone. The kids are in college my wife's working in phoenix so uh, i'm getting it's like costanza i'm getting a lot done here right what's your normal split between phoenix and coronado i think it's like six seven months phoenix and a few months coronado and then on the road covid's been like eight months phoenix four months coronado but uh well that'll change a little bit as we as 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 COVID, as we learn to live with COVID. doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. So we'll just learn to live with it. I hear you. And then both your kids are in college? Yeah. My daughter's graduated. She works at Rally Road in New York. It's a portfolio company, but she's worked there over a year and was an intern there. Loves the whole fractional cultural uh, asset uh, IPOs, like collectibles. And my son is uh, a golf nut and he's at UNLV. Uh, doing like a PGA hospitality program. Nice. They figured out how to SEO that and get kids that search for for golf careers to go to UNLV for four or five years. Good scam. And they get to go to class actually with COVID or what? He Who sent knows? me a picture yesterday. It was pretty funny of him hitting into like one of those like machine, you know, like one of those. I think the first. I mean, he's happy. It's just all golf all the time. So it's like. I don't even know what the hell they're doing there. Yeah, exactly. Whatever it is, it's keeping them off the streets. And can you imagine going to school in Vegas? That would have been a, a nightmare for me. But uh, I think it's a nightmare. I think Vegas is, you know, the Vegas that I remember was kind of, you know, was never classy. But yeah, a little C. Sinatra era was like people wore suits and smoking jackets. And, and uh, but uh, Vegas is great for food and friends. And it's a little overwhelming. Uh, is he going to uh, play golf there? He might try and walk on. I don't think he's good enough, but like he's definitely going to play club golf and and uh, just loves the game. It's plus one. He's, he's a great golfer. Yeah, I had Matt Holler back on here who played at Wake Forest, and he's like a plus one now. And it was we spent ten minutes talking about the golf between him as a plus one and the guys on tour is as big as between me as a eighteen and him as a plus one. He's Correct. Like, the numbers start to make a little difference and they're just it's so- like Richter scale. Like yes. when, you know, it, once you go from like a two to a plus one, that's Richter scale. And then if you go to a plus one, plus two, it's probably Richter scale. And if you're plus four, it's like bananas. Yeah. Uh, you Dustin know. Johnson. 
Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to talk to you too about cycling. I'm a bit of a cyclist myself. So what, how often you, when did you get into that? You seem to love it. Do you do Peloton as well? Yeah, I just got a Peloton. I'm like, I had, a, I had a weird, let's see, I've been riding my whole life, but like on and off in this last five years on. And I'm definitely not in great shape. I'm like fit, but I only do a few. It's not like I do weights and, and I'm not like a stretch machine and I do yoga. I do a little bit of everything, but like cycling and a little bit of running and hiking. But it's, it's, it's 90% cycling as my fitness. And um, the it's just the kind of it's the one thing I do that's weird and different. And not everybody does it, but I love it. And I do like the Peloton. I think it's like when I run out of time, it's kind of a forced way to burn calories. It's very structured. And I love that part of it. If I only have half an hour, you an uh, investor in Peloton. I own the stock. It's done, yeah. it's had a rough six months. I think you know I buy the dip type of company for me. It's one of my core eight to eighty positions. I think it's a crossover metaverse. You know, it's it's Netflix meets fitness meets data meets community. I mean, it's hard for them to screw it up at this point. Right. The if, is- if the product remains good, like there's a few things. So far, I have no complaints. It's it's much like a, people love their Tesla. I think people love their Peloton. Obviously, Tesla's a bigger business and harder business. But you know, Peloton's a fascinating company. Um, so you don't buy into the it's a screen on a bike, right? Like people are comparing it to a bike. It is a screen on a bike, but it is a fucking fifty nine dollars subscription, which makes cool. me bullish on Netflix. I think they're undercharging. Oh. Uh, I think they have some elasticity if if, if if, and again, Netflix could buy Pel- like again, like the, the world that we live in, you know, I'm off topic, but we that's all right. Have yeah. Topic. We have a topic in the world where, where we live in a rare asset world, right? Because valuations throw them out the window. Like, yeah. seriously, like, like you can't, if someone starts to talk about fundamentals with me, I'm like, are you fucking insane? <laughs> I, fundamentals aren't working at seed stage startups. Like, you know what? What I used to do in 2006, 2007, you know, at StockTwits, we raised money on a $600,000 valuation. I thought that was a good deal. Right? Yeah. Like you, I could go out and raise today on my brand and on StockTwits, I could go raise a seed round at 20 million valuation. Yeah. So, so, so we've lost, the script is gone. Um, and in, so in a world where there is no script and the government's printing money and no one wants to be poor and they print their money, you have to assume this is now embed fixed into the system like interest rates will rise based on nothing that's in the textbooks because they're not stopping what they're doing so if interest rates are going to rise it's not because i some guy on cnbc has it figured out they're going to rise when for reasons that we don't understand today and then they're going to start rising i mean again based on what the textbooks say we're screwed and obviously we're not and based on what uh, our politicians are doing and pol- politicized, politicizing the markets. Uh, we're screwed. Um, but here we are. Here we so, are. So in that world, uh, anybody who talks fundamentals, I don't know. It's, it's a greater fool theory at this point. And you have to have a good thesis and you have to have great money management. And so I believe in this rare asset thing. And there's a certain amount of companies with rare assets. That, the, uh- uh, you have a Tesla, right? I think I've seen you tweet about your I Tesla. Don't. I wanted one. I was going to get one. I'm happy I didn't. Okay. Uh, I am going to eventually be a Tesla person um, when the range gets to a point where I can drive from Phoenix ah. to San Diego without having to pull over for 40 minutes or half an right. hour. Right. We, That's not what I want to do. We've got one but, here in Chicago, but it, the use case is perfect, right? You go yeah. downtown, you go around. It never has yeah. to be supercharged. If I wasn't driving in a world that i want to drive like la phoenix san diego i i think i'd have a tesla and i think once the range is 500 miles and um i think i'll be there because i don't want to pull over that's like one of the perks i would imagine yeah. you know it's not stopping although the mm-hmm. games are pretty fun in there right the kids are like come on let's supercharge i want to play that game Oh, wow. So yeah. So, so that community I'm starting to see as my friends, you know, I had a friend here visiting this week and he had a Tesla and I had to go help, you know, I had to go to find a super state charger and blah, blah, this. And I got to see the community at large of like what goes on behind the scenes of owning a Tesla. And it's like the people are, are hooked. They, he's built, you know, kudos to him. He's built, I think the financial 
people that want to short it based on the financials, I'm sure they have a great textbook case. Yeah. But what they don't understand is that it's a rare digital asset and he's a rare human being. And he's built, if the products suck, there'd be no, there'd be no stopping the short sellers, but the product's great. So he has a rare asset and we're seeing this in crypto. And now we're seeing it in, you know, with certain companies where the valuations are based on how people feel. Yeah. Real, and, real quick on the Tesla, the, uh, when I have people in their like finance people in Chicago and they see the screen and they see like the little body walking and a bike and they're like, they get it. It clicks in their brain. of like, Oh, they're collecting all this data. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. Hold on. They're collecting all the data and they've built, listen, you got to go charge it a supercharger. They've kept control of what I think the right things they want to keep control of for the experience. And it's hard to bet against that guy. I'm not a user. And I think that's cost me a fortune. I think the lesson of Tesla and the lesson of Peloton and the lesson of Nike and the lesson of Google, the companies that I really own and of, and of, is my mistake with Tesla is not owning the product. So you mentioned the eight for 80, and that's kind of what you're talking about. Explain, dive into that a little bit more. You think these are companies that will be around, you know, that people are- Yeah, I mean, they always, everybody wants to create generational companies. And we had those for decades, Exxon's of the world, and maybe JP Morgan's and, but they weren't, I mean, the cloud changed everything, right? Like the cloud turned business on its head. We went from an extraction-based world to an expansionary world uh, where, you know, if you put stuff in the cloud, anything's possible. And so we've got into some new growth paradigm where eventually we're a crypto where machines will just pay machines. Like, you know, people may not like it, but like, I want to own growth. I want to own software companies that don't have any employees and then just our digital toll roads. And I think we're seeing that with Ethereum and Solana at some levels, people just pure software and everybody getting paid for contracts and gas fees and using the highway and it's all being done on a ledger. And these are, these are tremendous growth opportunities that may not have fundamentals the way textbooks and Warren Buffett and, and you know, the true uh, stock market uh, fundamentals were created. But I think the crypto market is much like the stock market. It's just going to require a whole new set of fundamentals that people will agree upon. Now, in the meantime, anything can happen. Stocks can go up and down like bananas, as we've seen. But like until there's like some gr- agreed upon standard of, 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 of fundamentals, shit's breaking and it's pretty wild. And then you have lack of institutions with growth. And it's pretty fun to see retail make a fortune. I mean, literally tens of thousands of, of, of retail investors in crypto are making fortunes. They are yeah. the, they're the new... You know, go west, young men. They're the new farmers of the agricultural revolution. It's a new breed of 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 uh, wealth. Do you Truly th- amazing. Um, do you think there's a social? You know, getting deep right away here. But do you think there's a social downside to that? Of like, if there's just software that makes money and you don't need employees, you don't need right. Is it just, or then hey, you got to shift from being an employee to an investor. Yeah, that's what I think. I think we've inv- and we've. If you want to have some sort of life fulfillment, you need to be an investor. You're not going to get fulfillment from driving an Uber in the new economy or living in the metaverse. Uh, you may get from fulfillment as a creator. Of course, you get fulfillment. There is the new tradesman, which is a creator, and that is could be a digital creator, could be a digital artist, could be a designer of apps. Um, but that's a narrow group of people that are going to be good enough to, to build products for this next generation. So, so, but if did lawyers or accountants ever get job satisfaction, were they happy? <laughs> they were middle-class were ad execs smoking cigarettes and, and entertaining clients. Um, was that a good business? Was that a good lifestyle? Yeah. Um, glorified it in Mad Men, but that looked like a pretty fucking shit lifestyle and, and housewives were miserable and doing coke yeah um so i think we're in a lot of bike riding going on there so maybe maybe it's the opposite maybe we've been living in a social 
uh, travesty. And now we're finally coming out of it where people don't have to be miserable uh, trudging to work. They don't have to be miserable being away from their kids. They don't have to be miserable getting on planes and dealing with weather and cancellations and, and people coughing on them. So, uh, so I would say, I think everybody's got the spin wrong. I think people have been living in misery and now they get to live in some sort of freedom with their time, but That's it's right. change, right? Like, you know, but I think it's all good because I'd rather invest than work. Yeah, which leads me into you appear, I'll throw out appear to have it all figured out. Um, <laughs> posting pics from the beach and up on your hikes and on the Reddit, you kind of fall into the social, uh, the iceberg fallacy of just seeing what you want us to see. But having said that, right, do you think you designed that on purpose of like, here's the career I want to do so I have this time? Or did that end as you went down this path and you ended up with this work-life balance and all this good time you have? Yeah, I, am, I am 55, so it's not like I'm 30 and killing it. You know, yeah. I'm supposed to be somewhat successful by this age. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, so I think I'm like on pace with like the last generation. You know, I grinded. Uh, I wish I, I wish I wish I'd been more focused in my 30s and 40s. And I think part of the humor of it all is just is just trying. Yeah, it's a slice we're all faking it and our social profiles are a little bit, I try and be pretty honest. You can't give everybody everything. Um, but it seems if someone came to you and said, Hey, I'll pay you eight times what you make now a year in your investments, plus the upside, whatever, right? If the economics were eight times better, but you got to go into this office five days a week, would you? Yeah, I don't it? think there is a job that anybody would pay me eight times of what I'm making. Yeah. So I'm pretty, <laughs> I feel pretty safe. I'm unemployable. I think, yeah, I mean, I built a life that is, I got the, like, the path. I got everything just about right. And, but again, if it was right, I would have done this when I was 45. Yeah. So yeah. I'm still 10 years further along. It's not perfect. You know, I'd like to be a little bit younger to have all this freedom. So it's not perfect. It's just, luckily for me, I'm still young enough that I get to enjoy some of the fruits of this era which is a digital era on the verge of becoming a metaverse era. Uh, but I firmly have one foot in the physical world still. I like riding, I like traveling, I like eating out. Uh, but I do like some of the changes that COVID brought because I think I don't like to worry about, you know, uh, conspiracy theories. And there's plenty of conspiracy theories that kind of make sense to me. But at the same time, it is what it is. Like, I'm not running the shop. And yeah. So, you know, I'm a classic trend follower. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm aggravated. I'm cynical. I don't really trust government. I don't really trust corporations. Well, they're all fucking getting it. Any they're all going to get theirs. Yeah, but uh, you, see, you seem to have a unique ability to say, like, I don't trust any of that, but I'm still fully invested, right? It's too many people are like, I don't trust any of that, so I'm in cash or I'm all in yeah. Bitcoin, right? Or they, they take the wrong route and say, I'm scared of all that, so I'm not going to invest anything. Um, yeah, I mean, all I got to do is not be the last guy out. I don't need to be the first guy in, and I don't want to be the last guy out. So I, with those two basic principles, even assuming the market's rigged, which I do, every time I buy a stock, I'm trying to figure out, or a startup, I'm trying to figure out what my downside is and what my potential upside is. And if the math makes sense, you know, I stay in, a, in, a, in, a, in something. Um, is that what you, wrong. that's what you mean by that. trend? Following? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's what I mean by trend following. Like I, I, I try and follow really smart people that, that are in trades that, that makes sense to I me. Mean, this goes to the eight to 80, eight year olds use the products, 80 year olds use the product. Uh, there's obviously products that eight year olds are using that you think, eight, you know, if you want true growth, you try and find a product that 80 year olds are using and but you know that eight year olds are going to start using it or vice versa, you know, like the metaverse, eight, 10 year olds are using it, but you know, 80 year olds will use it. Uh, that's where you get true growth. Um, but I like to own with my real money companies that, you know, aren't as volatile. Like I say, they're, they're used by eight year olds and 80 year olds when the market sells off really hard, they go on sale a couple times a year or once a year and you buy them. Which is and, what's, What's that list look like? Nike. Today it looks like I'm scared because these companies are all overvalued. The, the, the list got hammered in 
the couple Chinese stocks that I own, the 8 to 80, Tencent and Alibaba. So like I said, there's always constant you know, reshuffling and gardening of your portfolio. But I, I've, I've, you know, in the last couple of months, I've dropped China. Just, I don't even know why I had it in there, you know, yeah. but, uh, you know, I figured Tencent and Alibaba were like 8 to 80 companies and they really are. Yeah. Right? They just happen to be in, in, in China. Yeah, and they have to own some things that the government could just take away from them. Yeah. Or, or just change the rules. Uh, you know, they're changing shareholder base. So it's like, do I, do I, you know, so, so, so do I want that aggravation in my life? Do I believe they're going to zero? No. Uh, am, I the, am I panicking? Probably. But at the same time, I don't like when the rules change. And so you have to adjust. And I don't, you know, you know, so I have to constantly tune my portfolio to a life that I feel is fairer. It's all yeah. relative because the markets are rigged. Um, but assuming, you- that, assuming that you believe that, um, and I do, you can still win because you, you, you only have to be right a few times. It's like back to my Montana, we would tell the joke there. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You only got to be faster than grandpa who we were mm-hmm. hiking with, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't yeah. matter that they're rigged. You only got to be faster than the guy that the rigging's going to get cut, caught up to. And I'm following smart people on technology that are 9,000 years ahead of everybody else. Too many people choose not to do the work to follow these people that have a, have a career success of being right around growth and technology. And so I have no ego. If I have to follow really smart people to make a buck, I mean, you couldn't talk about an easier way to, to draft behind very smart people than in investing. You can do it in sports. You know, like I said, cycling, you do it in sports. These guys ride the Tour de France. They go 21 days. They generally are riding as a group for 18 of those days. And there's three or three or so days or a few hours a day where they're on their own and making decisions about, do they stay with the pack? Do they break away from the pack? And that's really what investing is, right? You don't have to you can stay pretty close to the indexes and try and really figure out where you have a slight edge and power through with that one or two ideas that differentiate you from the index, or you can build your own portfolio, or you can go very narrow because you really believe the people that you follow, whether it's around crypto or whether it's around uh, commodities or whether it's around um, uh, software, that you have an incredible edge and let other people do the work for you. So those are like everybody. Fred Wilson type people. Yeah, like it's not broken. Like the people that got me into crypto are not, they're not rocket scientists. They they just have, have a history of being right about big technological trends. And, um, you know, it's up to me to, to allocate the proper amounts from my portfolio based on my risk profile and based on my time horizons. But I don't need to call Fred or Chris Dixon or ask them to tweet you know, I get people like, hey, what do you think about Farfetch? And I'm like, the same as I thought about it two days ago. I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm not going to call Fred or Chris Dixon and go, what do you think about Bitcoin? Like, right. I'll know when they are done. And uh, it won't be at the exact top and it won't be, they won't be buying at the exact bottoms. But I know directionally that these people are bullish. They have very little, uh, they don't, they're not doing it for the money at this point. They're doing, they have nothing but reputation risk. So when you can line up people that have, the capital, the past history of being successful or right around their domain, and they're taking reputation risk over financial risk by sharing their, their thoughts. Those are a really good cocktail for you trend following or, or what I would say uh, drafting behind very smart people. And, and that's my little trick. It's not really... It's working, man. It's worked for like 15 years. Yeah. So, and if people want to draft behind me, great. Go they should know what I'm doing, which is I'm not a rocket science. I'm drafting behind people that, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So we're so, all playing this game. And that's why I think trend following works. You know, it's that old stick of bullhorn. And then someone hears it and they spread the word. And it's just, I'm trying to get as close to the source of true expertise as possible. But so in my world where we've had people, I think, you know, Eric Crittenden, right? Um, Like trend following is a loaded term. It's a defined term. So right of like we're tracking 85 global futures markets and currencies and commodities. And technically, 
right? Systematically buying the breakouts above certain moving averages or levels. I totally believe in that too, but someone, I just don't have the time to really live by it. But yes, Eric's great at that and I believe in that, yep. But so you're when you're saying trend volume, it's more of a, a mantra instead of a, right? You're not saying, oh, Bitcoin broke below 42,000. I believe broke. in it. I just... I just would rather take a much longer view of what a trend is and trade around it a little bit, but I'm not as precise as a typical trend follower. It is more of a mantra, much like yoga is kind of a mantra. Everybody yeah. practices it differently. And so let's just call like to me, yoga and trend following are the same thing. Like they're just mantras. Correct. Yeah. Well, and I think it's just, if you have a method that you can apply consistently, that's the trick, right? No matter what it is, but if you can do it consistently, you're going to, right? If you're doing it this way for a year, then flip another way for a year and flip back and forth, that's where you get into trouble. Yeah. I mean, it would be a bummer for me if like Chris Dixon retired or Mark Andreessen retired or Fred Wilson said, I'm not writing anymore. I'm like, what? There yeah. goes my edge. That uh, was and so I'm constantly looking for people that are right a lot. And I have them on my podcast. Like my podcast is just basically me trying to be nice to people that I want to like make sure <laughs> they still respond to my emails, whether it's Jeff Richards or Om Malik, people that are just living inside these trends and putting their own money on the line and are willing to share. They're going to be wrong a lot, but if you can catch a few big trends, and I've caught in a few, which is just software and now crypto, um, I don't know how much more you can do. Right. And, and so, so that's what I think about trend following is like find really smart people that have domain experience and then just fucking stay out of their way and leave them alone. So it's more social, social trend yeah. following. Very much social, name. very much um, technology focused. And what do you, I'm jumping all over the, I'm going to ask this question second, but back to crypto, like, so what percent do you think is, and you're not giving investment advice here, but just for you, what percent makes sense, right? People are like, hey, it's worth 1% of your net worth just as a call. Yeah, option. I don't, I, I really struggle with that because everybody, I, because I've gone from zero to 80% down to 50%. It depends on my private portfolio, right? I have a very barbelled approach. I've shared it with Josh in the book, but I, because of so much risk that I take in my age and my Canadian conservative background, I'm very high cash, always have been, because I'm always writing checks to weird, obscure things. And sometimes I write 10 a month and sometimes I don't write any for a year. So there's periods where I'm just flush and not thinking about investing or beating the indexes. And then there's other periods where I'm like, oh my God, I got to raise cash because it's not even that I own stocks or crypto, it's just all my money's in the private market. So for me with crypto, it's like, it started out as like, okay, I gotta have some exposure. Now it's, I would say it's over 50% of my liquid net worth. Really? Yeah. 50. And then yeah. how diversified is that? Like 10 I don't plus? know, because it's in some funds that okay. are somewhat liquid. So it's like, it's very illiquid if you said it, but it's worked for me, you know, whether it's been helium or Solana or serum, it's, you know, I'm letting other people invest for me in this space. Again, there's another thesis I have around trend following, which is like, I don't mind paying fees. You know, trend followers have always had high fees because the returns are potentially outsized. And yeah. so the type of trend following I believe is, you know, I had never believed in if you believe in indexing, I get it. But if I'm a trend follower, I'll pay fees for people who are really good at it and have a great insights into catching and riding trends. So, so in crypto, I've just paid managers. Okay. You know, and then I learn from them. So I, I treat them as my research department. And if they're if you find a few good ones, their research becomes your way of doubling down or tripling down on a position they may hold on your own through Coinbase or through an exchange. But, but luckily I've been in some good funds. But I, I would say of my liquid, it's, it's over 50%, but I'm not uncomfortable because I feel like there's fundamentals developing. So in 2017, there were no fundamentals. It was purely the Wild West. And this time around, it's almost all fundamentals. They, their valuations are crazy, but it's almost all fundamentals. You know. So do you? So you actually care what they're doing? 
Or are you just have to at this point? You're yeah. an idiot after 2017 if you're going to speculate and truly not understand the use cases and, and the development in the communities around these projects and and true fundamentals like how many how, how much is is being staked, how much how much developer you know what what's happening on these platforms, and so we're starting to see that take shape. It's not it's not really it's not pure fundamentals yet, but we're seeing the beginnings of fundamentals and, and the morning stars of crypto getting built and the, and the, and, and the ways to measure fundamentals, whether we like them or not, there's, 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 you know, whether it's Dune, there's projects getting funded and, and that are creating the fundamentals that will be accepted as generally that people will share data around that says, oh, this is undervalued based on this metric. Yeah, on how many that's people exciting. are using the protocol or whatever. Yeah, that's exciting. Like that's why I think it's more like stocks than it is currencies. Um, and do you think it's more? You think people would be too late? Like, is the trends already well? No, it's just starting. I think these breakouts in the summer, after the horrific, you know, Chinese, like kind of like a one month crash or two month crash in April, May, or June, whenever it was. Yeah. Um, it was pretty violent, and you could kind of pin it to the Chinese stopping the mining. And but it, as we as we see again, the decentral that only helps decentralization. So it seems like it's like a roach. You know, crypto. You you think you got one, and there's ten more. So um, I think decentralization is just coming. Yeah, and I think you can fight it, or you can watch it or you can do what i'm doing is participate and because it's coming all the things that come with an ecosystem are happening research to uh fundamentals uh, contextual you know understandings of relative values and um growth like yeah. Some of these want... blockchains, whether it's Solana or Ethereum, are, are incredible, the amount of, of activity that's happening on it. And, and we're seeing that with people with gas fees being as high as they are. So I try and tell people it's like these are MasterCard. If you were, if you were when, when people were, you know, sending money over a wire or passing bags of gold or however they're doing before a debit card and the Visa and MasterCard, and the first five years or 10 years of Visa and MasterCard, people were like, what? I don't trust that. Yeah. Uh, what am I going to do if I travel? Like we traveled when I was a kid with American Express traveler's checks taped around our body. Yeah. That was the Been gold. There. That was the gold. You couldn't lose your traveler's checks. That seems so archaic. Yeah. And well, not seems it is. So for people to dismiss crypto when it really does make sense around having a digitized ledger, um, pretty fascinating. With that comes great risk you know fraud and 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 uh but again this is this is happening whether people like it or, like not. It or not yeah and we could spend hours on like right but there's there for sure a lot of risk but not too late and to me i like that you're saying hey i don't have the time or the skill set to go in and pick 10 of these 500 roaches out there like let the pros let some pros pick out the roaches for me or let the pros circle 50 and then I'll try and pick two based on like my under who I read and how I understand and what the direction of the and what the angle of ascent is or descent. Uh, I'll still apply my own weird rudimentary trend following and uh, biases to these things, but I'd like it to be circled to 50. I don't want to study 500 no. blockchains. So moving on, um, I think you've said somewhere, or I'm going to attribute it to you anyway, of it's never been a better time to be an investor, mm -hmm. um, right? With all the tools, research, quotes, uh, access, fractional shares, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, so just what's your general thought on that? Is, is that true? Was that you who said that? Um, yeah, it's me. I've been saying it forever. <laughs> um, and I think we had this long period of no, you know, I, I, I I think you you give people a phone, a social network, uh, bandwidth, um, and uh, and you just can't put it back in the bottle. 
Yeah. And then you throw in the macro picture, which is governments printing money and, and tax laws that are forcing people to do estate planning and that are forcing you to get, whether you like your kids or not, passing the money down to your kids is really, we see it with Trump, like it's the tax thing that creates the Trump family. It's not any sort of genius. Once you have money, you, you, you protect it by passing it down. That's the estate. Yeah. Thing. So there's going to be this tremendous trickle down of capital whatever you call this from uh, the last two generations to Gen Z and millennials. So if you are not teaching your kids how to invest, you have really fucked yourself and you're in the fortunes you have built because that's what they're going to be doing. Yeah. You know, maybe you want them to go to law school, but if they were practicing law, your kids are underachieving. There's no 50 year old lawyer that's happy or fulfilled. So, um, so these, this next generation is going to be an investing class and they're going to have time on their hands and they're going to do weird things and they'll be investing in all kinds of, of things and they'll be tracking they'll have to be software that tracks all this and they'll have to be you know ways to organize all this and ways to uh, uh invest like we're seeing with zoom you know and no one thought they'd be writing checks without meeting people of zooms yeah create. there's just no way people and that that's the only way to do it yeah, we've got a bunch of funds that we work with, like a guy moved to Jackson Hole, a guy's in Mississippi, like, you know, places that the allocators wasn't on their route, they were never going to visit. Now they're getting meetings, Zoom meetings and getting checks. Yeah, I mean, we raised a hundred million dollar fund without going on the road and we struggled for years to raise capital doing face to face meetings. So who's to say what's right? All we can do is like take the inputs that are around us and, and do the best, you know, that's why I said, you got to play with these tools. You can't just say zoom stupid or yeah. you can't dismiss all these tools. So crypto is probably, and again, I'm late. So you say, is it late? I think it's early from when it was first whispered, whispered to me in 2011. Um, I think we're at the 94, 95 era of internet, like the UU net exodus, uh, part of the internet. Yeah. And I think the wallets are the Netscape Internet Explorer moment where, you know, this is basic, this internet is all about money and transactions and tracking and communications. But I love to tell the story. If I could see who was, who bought my Apple shares in 2004 after it doubled. And I was so excited that the iPod, I thought it was overvalued yeah. because the yeah. iPod six wouldn't be as successful as the iPod. In, in a world where I could track who bought that stock from me and, and then we could have a laugh about it, has he held it or where that stock went? You can't do that in the old world. No. In this new world, you could literally, you know, we joke about NFTs or whatever, but you can literally start tracking these things from day one and see where they end up. Yeah. Although that's like my dystopian future. That's a little scary, right? Of like some guys showing up at your door of like, I want my Apple shares back. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, listen, but it's happening. You can hate it or you can distrust it, but this is the world that is coming because the general ledger makes sense. Yeah. Because governments can't. This whole idea of like just going to sell a house with the trust and the title and the this and the that, these kids are not going to put up with that. They've figured out a new way to just take title and point to a digital spine or a ledger to say, this is mine. Yeah. And what it's happening. and as as it's become super easy to invest as an individual, is it also like we're just giving everyone the ability to shoot themselves in the foot? Oh like, yeah. Has it become too dangerous? Like where do yeah, we cross that line? Really, it's never been a better time and it's never been more dangerous. I would have to agree. Um, but that danger is great for wily veterans. It's where it's like, yeah. hey, sorry, kids, get your fucking lickings because I went through the same thing. I'm licking my chops. You know, this is why I say teach your kids to start investing young because in 20 years, they're going to be the veterans. And it's like learning English. You got to get better at it. And it's a language. And the sooner kids can learn this language or the sooner anybody of sound mind can learn to invest, the better. Um, but do you think it's become over gamified? Like too easy? Right, like the Again, Bill I, Brewster on the pod, whose cousin was the the kid who unfortunately killed himself after the margin call on Robin Hood. Right, like yeah, I mean it's over gamified, obviously. But what does that mean? Yeah, because the, we were over interneted in '99. We had Global Crossing, we had WorldCom, we had all these fucking quests. We had all these people laying cable to get people on the internet. 
So who are we going to blame? Like, let's blame them because if we, we wouldn't be trading on E-Trade if these guys hadn't laid the cable. So, so we've had this massive onboarding in 1999. So the internet bubble at least gave us millions of people online. Now we have this new bubble and it is a bubble and it's created by uh, COVID and the Fed and, and, and just people having all this free time and technology and software, blah, blah, blah. And we have this massive new bubble, but let's be honest about it. What, it was all going to happen anyways. And now all we did was get these hundreds of millions and millions, uh, maybe billions of people onto this digital world, right? They would call it the metaverse, call it whatever you want, yeah. but they're living digitally. And it may be because the government made up COVID, but whatever, it was inevitable. Was paying with cash is stupid. I had it. Wasn't paying with a debit it. card is stupid. So now we fast forward at everything. You know, we used to see telephone poles. And now if we see a telephone pole, we go, why is there a fucking telephone pole wrecking my view? Why isn't this underground? So again, like this stuff was coming. All we've done is speed it up. And with the speed comes gamification, comes people doing weird things. And it's unfortunate. It really is. But I don't think it's over gamified like Schwab. And if you think about like Schwab and E-Trade and 99 Day Tech and two thousand, they, yeah. they were all bells and whistles. You would open up your, you would open up your desktop and there'd be like blinking lights and like red and green. It was like a zoo. And now it's just your mobile phone. And so I, again, like it's, I don't think it's any more gamified than it was in 99. I think it's just better designed. Yeah, because you you have to look at this thing on your phone and size up the market off one little screen. So I actually think it's just better design, which just has different funnels. And if people aren't careful and go down the wrong funnels, it's it's a pretty nasty rabbit hole. Like if you go to YouTube and and you you declare yourself a Trumpster or some or a libtard, you're going to get served videos that just embed you further into that world. Yeah, that's gamification too. It's actually more horrific because people are just getting fed dung all day. You know, so we got to define what gamification is. There's been some tragedies that have come with this onboarding of, you know, 100 million new investors. It's, right. a, tragedy. it's a tragedy. I don't know how you protect against it. Um, and building on that, where do you think you personally, since you've gotten into crypto, have you ever been a futures guy? Have you ever traded futures? No, I really am really confused by leverage. I think it's my conservative nature. I don't like the idea of like 1% being worth 20%. And, yeah. And so I think it's a, it's a real skill that I think people have to be able to manage positions that, have, that I just understand cash and equity. I don't understand. Wait a minute. I've never traded options. I don't like Yeah, that. that's going to be my next question on options because everything you just said, it's even magnified in the option space, right? Like options volume is its highest ever. Um, I've made some humongous mistakes and I've written about them in, in, in the, every time I've dabbled, I think I know something and I've just got my ass handed to me. So again, I'm never going to get the returns that a great futures or options trader would get. But again, I, I'm living within my own, I'm not competing against everybody. I'm competing. The game that I'm playing is just, um, it's a good question. I mean, the game that I'm playing is just trying to, you know, make a great living. Yeah. And save it, it's, you know, make a lot of money. Yeah. Because that's You're the game, upward, uh, upward to the right. There's a million ways to play the game. Are you a billionaire yet? Getting close? <laughs> I mean, it depends. I mean, it just depends on. Depends on the print. Not, I'm kidding. It depends on how much money the government continues to print. At some point, we'll all be billionaires. I mean, honestly, it's a joke. Yeah, right. Like, what does it mean when, when we all are? Mean? What does it mean anymore? No, I mean, you look at real estate prices. I'm like, I don't understand this thing. Like, I thought when I bought my first home with my wife in, 19, in 1997, and we paid like 120 grand for a house in Phoenix, and we we're like, oh my God, this is insane. You know, and so what do I know? Like inflation is bananas. Yeah, I'm sure it's not cheap there in Coronado. It's, but but I think it's undervalued. So again, like we go back and forth. Like I think California beachfront property, not inland beachfront is undervalued. Yeah, you there's know? only one Coronado. Well, there's only one. Yeah, there's only a certain amount 
of real estate. I'm not a real estate person, but at some level where crypto prices are and where other things are, I'll say, hey, I just would rather own real estate. And so at some point you get in your life where you realize you understand that like, I'd rather own a Porsche or another piece of real estate than an NFT. <laughs> yeah. um, and right now kids are all in on digital. And right, they they're vice versa. They don't right. want cars and they don't want stuff in their house and they don't need four seasons of clothes or, or some fancy dress. They're spending their money on their community and how to show off in their own way, just like you and I showed off with the first flat screen or yeah. CD yeah. ROM collection or our suits or our wool suits or, you know what I mean? Or our dress shoes. Yeah, yeah. They're just, watch. They're just, or watch. They're doing watch. I mean, listen, so certain things that come back in style too. Like watches are important because they, there's a supply demand thing and there's a artistic uh there's art involved in culture and all that stuff. But when it relates to how kids are behaving, I think they're doing, based on the world that they live in, digital makes complete sense. And what, have you gotten into the NFT space at all? No, but I'm, I'm totally get it. See, I'm because vice versa. I'm a community I'm like, guy. Like Stocktwits has thought about this forever, right? Like we should have had avatars for people that wanted to pay. Like we haven't, we've missed many things along this trend because we think like stock people like, okay, leave people alone. Let them talk about their stocks, but there's all kinds of community things. And that's what NFTs are. They're just little communities. Some of them are bigger communities yeah. of affinity around objects. And they're weird to us old people. Right. I'm uh, like, I get crypto sort of, I under, I own some, I understand it. But then the NFT seems totally out in left field to me. Which seems weird when I'm already in the crypto lane, but it's like, come on. Well, crypto doesn't mean anything unless you can use it. Right. And so I, I totally get the NFTs. I didn't get the 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 NBA Top Shop part because I'm like, okay, that seems very narrow. Yeah. But I do get the JPEG stuff in in people paying for a rare thing if they love it. And with it comes community. It's like you would join, you know, people join Riviera Country Club that, and you can't join if you don't live, if you live in LA. So the only reason to join Riviera is if you can't live there. So I mean, what do you play one month a year and you pay 300 grand a year? Yeah. So how is that different than buying an NFT that gets you access to a community that you may use every day? Right. But I guess that's where people, old people get confused. Of like what, how is it linked to a community? I'm just buying a JPEG but I get to oh, show because, it off in my community. Because everybody may get a password that owns that JPEG to a, to a, a room, a telegram room or a discord room where they talk about certain things that they've access to a club. Again, I, again, I don't know, but it's all right. It's no different than people joining a club or back in Pharaoh's time, praying to a gold cow, right. <laughs> that they yeah. built themselves and carry it around and felt that was what, was that was what they would rally around. These are just new forms of community um, and the value system and the, the fundamentals make no sense. I will say the fundamentals make no sense, but, uh, and that's why I'm not buying them. I don't like buying something and then seeing the value change 90% a day. Yeah. Um, I like bid and ass that are like stable. The, my my pet theory is that these Chicago prop firms and maybe some Swiss ones and whatnot just got together in a bar late one night and they're like, trading this stock stuff's boring. We've got the game rigged. This is all figured out. Let's create something that we can trade against each other and really show our true skill, right? Which was crypto and now NFTs. And I, I think there's some truth to that. I just think it's not them. It's the people left that got that and built their own. Yeah, there's no one at those places saying that. Those people left already to build FTX and coins. Yeah, yeah. And well, I don't know. You see these pictures of like the, yeah, I've heard you on another thing. It used to be about how many screens you had when I, but some of these shops still have all those screens and in six of them are the NFTs. They're like sitting there slinging these NFTs all day. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you talk about gamification. The world had to be designed. You had to be able to understand the market by looking at this screen. That's a skill. You may not like that I learned that skill. That's no different than we went from paper trading to screen trading to electronic trade. The new training is how do I size up all the markets and get it onto one little screen? Mm -hmm. We've done that now. 
the world has shrunk down to this screen. You right, can, that's I boring. can open up, I can show you my stock to page and you go, oh, I understand the markets. Now let's now we're going in the reverse direction where people will start to enjoying more screens again because they've learned how to read the market on this little screen. Shouldn't they be able to enjoy it on 10 screens? So this is the art part of it. It's like, we're going to have a reimagining what a desktop looks like. I'm back talking to you from a desktop. I haven't had a desktop in five years. Yeah. So um, because of Zoom, who would have thought it was because of a camera? So now that I have this beautiful M1 Apple chip machine, I can't wait to open Coifin and I can't wait to have seven screens open. And But I, I know that I'm only checking them once in a while. I'm not having them flash at me and I'm not really getting anything out of it other than the beautiful assemblage of data that I get to put together, but I'm not like staring at it all day and debating yeah. gold's doing and oil's doing and how everything's related. So, so I think there's now we're going to go, now that we've shrunk everything down here, some would call it gamification. I would call it just great, elegant design. Now you thought we had game of these people complaining about gamification over the last two years, just wait till you see what's coming with crypto and with, leverage and you know with swaps and with derivatives and the people that thought there was gaming have they really really yeah. would be, they were mistaken the gaming part is just starting and do you think it's is the sec woefully lagging right it's like uber just said oh screw the regulations we're just going to go in here and we'll figure out the registration part later um yeah at some level yeah i mean look at ftx they've They've decided to play friendly recently and like they they spun out Binance's investment. You know, Binance is like, fuck the US. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the rest of the world's pretty damn big. And so again, there's all these like maneuverings underneath. You've got it. If you want to do business in the US, there's rules. I think that's fantastic. I right. want to trade within some, even though I think it's rigged, I would prefer to trade within some defined set of rules. Yeah. Where you know if the, theft happens, you might have some oh, protection. First of all, you don't know because I've traded things and the, no, we're still getting screwed and I don't trust anything, but I do like the semblance of rules. I wish the SEC would enforce them more. I mean, there's plenty of rules that they, they've chosen not to enforce, whether it's around Elon Musk or Barstool or all these guys promoting yeah. stocks. I think it's criminal. Um, but that's what's your thought? Opinion. Yeah, what's that's your thought? Opinion. But if they can't, if in plain sight they won't hold the laws to certain people, that sucks. So <laughs> instead, we're going to get more laws that hurt you and I. So yeah, I have strong opinions about that, but I really believe in the SEC, the idea of the SEC and some governing body to set some rules. So what's the difference between Portnoy spouting that all off and somebody following like a hot stock on Stock Twins? Um, again, I, I'm not. I'm not. Well, Portnoy's example is he's he's literally saying I'm an idiot. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's saying that's an excuse, and I just call bullshit. I'm like, no, you're not an idiot. Yeah, he's you are a promoter, and you are running a gambling site, and then you're asking for people to go to jail on a brokerage site which is regulated. You know what I mean? And then you're investing in competitors and not disclosing it, and it's just so many conflicts. Yeah, but again, buyer beware. Like, all right, like I'm not gonna make a stand and go on TV and say I hate Barstool. I'm just like I've chosen to say I don't trust the guy. You know, like x them out of all my feeds. I'm like I don't want to hear anything about it. But but I I talk with friends who are like this. I'm like, but you don't trust him, do you? Like just seeing him talk, you can't trust him. And they're like, oh no, I, he built that whole thing. He's the smartest guy out there. I'm like, he is very granted, rich. but he's also blatantly promoting these things. And that it'll last until it doesn't last. Yeah, but I mean, he's a sports guy and he's built a great sports brand. Yeah. Stock stuff was funny. And then I realized I'm an idiot for promoting it because it's all just about driving people to his sports and gambling. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so I feel he was like getting I manipulated. NX. I'm an idiot. Like, I'm the dummy that got manipulated. That's fun. 10x leverage on that, right? Of like, hey, every idiot that comes yeah. here, I'm getting 10 views to my gambling site. Yeah, I make mistakes. Like I got sucked into the whole drama of it and I followed it and I was part of the game. And then I just said enough. Like I said, I don't trust them. So why would I talk about them? Um, but he's not, you can't stop them. 
No. And, and if he's going to be stopped or Elon Musk is going to be stopped, it's for breaking the rules. And somebody's got to hold these people accountable to the rules. Uh, and that's that's where we're at. And we saw this with Trump. It's like there's a different set of rules. Um, and that's dangerous. Maybe the Canadians will say this. Uh, no, I just think buyer beware. You have to understand that the rules are changing lately. And... Um, and invest accordingly. Like there's no one really there to protect you, especially in the crypto world. If you're going to do this, you got to be prepared that your account could get cleaned up. Do you, which is you're comfortable having 50% knowing that that could get cleaned up. Yeah. Well, luckily for me, what's the difference if I brought, how much different is my, again, these are all different depending on where you are. Yeah. Then I'd have another problem and I'd have to liquidate, bring it over, yeah, yeah. figure out, it's just not even worth it to me. And right, I'm bullish like, enough. But yes, I am taking that type of risk. And that's a little bit scary. But you don't yeah. have to sell your house and get divorced and all that. Stuff. Yeah. Bro. If that went to zero, everybody can laugh at me. And I just don't think it's going to happen. And, and at the same time, um, it wouldn't change my life. Yeah. I'd be mad and it would be very frustrating. But it would shrink the game and I know how to play the other side of the game. So it's, it's a risk. Yeah. But that's what you get paid for. Do you think this all has never been easier for individual investors? Is this the death knell for RAs for mutual funds or will they always exist? What are your thoughts on that? Well, RAs, have, like, there's a huge revolution going on. I think RAs that left what I think, I think people should pay for advice. So I think RAs that are good at what they do, they're still travel agents that have survived and real estate agents. So I think, I think if you have a good RA, they're definitely worth one plus percent. And if you have a shitty RA, they're not worth freeze to low a price or to freeze yeah. to high a price. So, but I think this is your money. I think everybody should have financial advisors. Some of them you won't pay. If, like Fred Wilson, is he a financial advisor of mine? Yes. I just don't call him for financial advice. Right. Uh, and he doesn't bill me. Um, but there's certain people that you, you know, I have Charlie, like I have people that manage my money for me and just try and help me think through asset allocation and these things. I'm still going to make mistakes, but I, I truly believe the RIA industry is ripe for growth and disruption and all kinds of chaos. I mean, it, it seems counter to the like individual investor. Everything's on a screen. I can click through. I don't need right, these kids, as we're calling them, don't want to talk to anyone, right? They just want to click, click, click. Today, so, I think as things get, get complicated and as they get their families and they have other things going on in their life and they're not trading NFTs and crypto and they want to own eight to 80 companies with cash flow. Again, I just think our, the, the service business around investing is going to be a big business. And you have this huge transition from 60, 40 portfolios to what is that 40% in bonds? What is that going to look like in 20 years? Yeah. So, and so I think there's a, I think good RIAs are in high demand. Um, and I think bad RIAs are screwed, just like the bad travel agents are screwed because technology is there to help people do this stuff themselves. That's going to, I'm going to title the pod of Howard thinks RIAs are like travel agents. Um. <laughs> yeah, there's still some alive. I don't know if that's truly the title, but what I, what I mean is, yeah, I, I get have it. To still use a travel agent because they know the cities and they, you know. That seems you and I would never do that. But I think financial advisors are really good around one area, whether it's venture capital or stock picking, can make a living. If you're just doing pure asset allocation, that's a tough yeah. BNRAA. But if you have well, tax, estate planning and all the rest. Yeah. Of if you can do taxes and really help people with trusts, and I've gone through all this, it's very complicated. So I think RAs are, are fine. Which also leads into your like talk about something that needs disruption, right? Of like, here's plug in all your situation and out comes a solution that gets automatically engineered for you. Yeah, it's not just that. It's like you got if if bonds aren't an option, you've got 40%. Let's say you want to take 20% of that and speculate in it. 
you know, RAs don't have the tools that allow their customers to have software that talks to all these things. You know, there's Orion software. There's, a, you know, I study this a lot. There's yeah. Orion, the, as I would call it. Orion, <laughs> sorry, Orion. But there's all these archaic ways that RAs have to hodgepodge to communicate with their clients for whatever the rules are. And that stuff needs to be upgraded a thousand percent. So yeah. that excites me because I think RAs are important, but I also think RAs aren't doing the best by their clients because they're selling a 60-40 asset allocation in a world where maybe that 40% should be in venture and in crypto and higher cash. You know yeah. what I mean? So the, my main question is, what does that, what does a portfolio look like for someone in their 30s that just inherited a lot of money? Is it 100% NASDAQ? Is it 60% NASDAQ, 20% cash, 20% venture capital? It definitely shouldn't be bond. I, don't, I just don't believe in it. Um, Return-free risk, as the new saying goes, right? Well, it's um, not a new saying. It's reality. Yeah. Like, I can't understand the math. So I can well, understand why Google will borrow at 0%. That's smart. It seems very smart. Uh, but I can't see why I would lend Google at 0%. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you want because you want to get your money back, right? If it's huge, I don't want my money back. I am yeah. I'm comfortable taking risks, and that's why I'm saying people yeah. need to teach their kids how to take risk and how to behave and how to like take responsibility for taking that risk and and understand risk. Do you? I use for my kids loved. I don't know if you know. Yeah, that. you know, I was. You got I, any I like recommendations? David, so. Yeah, I think it's a great product. David, you know, we almost invested. We've looked at the, at the company for a while. He's a really smart kid. Um, there's no one that's really owned that space, but Loved is a good product. It's a, do you like it? Yeah, my kids loved it because it was like, it bucketed everything, right? So my daughter was like, oh, I want, I'm interested in environment or like something earthy, right? And then she was like, and it gave you these different choices. And you could invest in the whole bucket or go different choices. And then my son was like, no, I like EA Sports. So he wanted to just click through and get like actual invest in EA sport. So yeah. it gave, yeah, it was nice. I just think that's the type of things that, you know, that I think you're doing the right thing. Like they're, they're, they're figuring out and they can look at their account and see the results. So, right. um, and, when, yeah, and I, those... we put a bunch of the money in, in March of last year. So he's like, but so now my new job is like, it's not always going to be like this. Right? It's not going to double. But maybe it is. Maybe your new job is to say, listen, we live in a new paradigm. No, I agree with you. It's a, it's, it's a bubble. I, and I say that comfortably, but I get the bubble could go on for three years. And I don't want to leave 600% on the table if, if my timing is off. So, yeah. yeah. So, but we are living in some kind of weird, you know. Uh, but that's vortex. your trend fund. But you don't get worried about like, the bubble could end tomorrow and like the crypto crash rides down. I assume it will. And I just... And, you know, March was pretty bad or May for crypto. Everything was down 50%. Again, like, I, this is, there is no risk-free return. But that's not an exit for you, right? Like you're saying, this trend is still in place, this long-term trend. I'm not going to get spooked out. Until I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you'll end up giving back stuff. But uh, it's like, you, like you're doing with your kids. Get them involved early and often and get them to make decisions and they'll make bad decisions and good decisions. But the sooner they learn this language as they're learning with you and loved, or some kids are learning with Robin Hood, the sooner the better. Yeah. And we'll stick with the parent corner for a second. How do you, my son's into golf uh, on the, he's seventh grader on the team, school team. Like how'd you keep your son interested or was he pushing you to keep playing? Uh, I mean, I wasn't a tiger dad. Um, yeah. But he just loved it. And I, I got him in early. I'm, I mean, in theory, I should have pushed him harder because there was about a six, seven year period where he stopped playing and did everything else. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel that's great. good for kids, though. Too. I mean, like investing, I don't think there's a better sport than golf. It's uh, you can play it your whole life and you can never really master it. And um, it's a good ball. It's a good, you know, parent kid type of lifetime game. What What's your handicap? Just my body type, <laughs> the pear-shaped human body, my the, sense of uh, humor, no athletic yeah. ability. Uh, uh, I don't know. Just at my, uh, I'm at like an eight. It's good. 
great. Yeah. It's got to be exciting. When did your son pass you? Because I'm nearly there. I'm like a 18 or 16. I was about 16 where I, I started. I've come close to beating him a few times. I've beat him on nine holes now occasionally. I can't hold it together. I actually beat him for 18. I think you were there when I beat him for 18 max at one point. So I, 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 I've, it's rare. I've, the, the last time I beat him, he was kind of happy about it. He was like, wow. Yeah, so way impressive. to go, Pops. Yeah. But it won't happen again, Dad, but it was pretty cool. And then um, he joined me the next day. So, but it was about 16, he passed me. And then I had to tell the story of like a couple of years ago, and we were, I would, what was your old festival called? Lynn's Stocktoberfest. Old, Stocktoberfest. I was going to say Lynn Sanity, but no, that was uh, Jeremy Lynn. Right. <laughs> Stocktoberfest. So we were going to come out to there and talk trend following, our type of trend following. Um, and we got on a call once. I think you had just finished running. And you were like, oh, my legs, I'm car bloating. I had all this pasta. You went on like a six minute rant on pasta and car bloating for your legs. <laughs> I'm like, who is this crazy man? Yeah. Um, so good to see you actually have somewhat of a rational brain here um, <laughs> as we're chatting. Yeah. <laughs> Did you still car bloat the legs or what? No, I mean, I'm just worried. Like uh, biking is one of those sports where you burn a lot of calories and you shouldn't be surprised that you feel like eating a lot of calories. It's no perfect, you know, biking just gets me hungry. I mean, a perfect world would just be not eating like a pig and not working out that hard. Yeah. But uh, there's a trade-off, you know, I like to eat. Uh, and you like bread that and pasta and carbs, so therefore I must work out. We finished with some quick, uh, like five favorites, so you can just give okay. a quick answer. Uh, so favorites, your bio says you're in, this, in search of the perfect sleep solution. You have a favorite sleep solution? What does that mean? Well, I'm back experimenting now, but unfortunately for me, it's still uh, ambient. It just works, you know, <laughs> I need to sleep. You know, it's kind of an easy hook. What happens mm -hmm. when you can't sleep? You're just thinking of all the stuff's running through your head? Yeah, it's just kind of a bad, uh, bad cycle of uh, not being able to turn off the brain. It's, it's probably a trick that I can master in the, under the right scenario but the drug works and i'm a kind of a, a a sucker for it perfect this episode brought to you by ambien um hmm. and favorite golf course two two questions favorite one you've played favorite one you'd like to play i, mean, I would say pebble i don't remember it's been 10 15 years but i would say pebble i really love playing with my friends in la at bel air or riviera um and then i'm not at an like same with restaurants i don't really i'm not chasing another like i've once i find something i like i'll just keep asking to do the same thing like whether it's whether it's dumplings or pasta or a steak i'm yeah. not constantly in search sleep is something yes we're humans we need it i'm constantly tinkering and trying to figure it out uh, when it comes to golf or food or anything else it's like no, if I find something good, I'll just keep going until it's not good. So you don't have Augusta on the bucket list or something? No. I mean, first of all, I think it looks really hard. But of course, I wouldn't. Yeah. We, but I'm not calling my friends going, how do we get on? Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, favorite bike ride? That I've ever done, I think, uh, I don't have a favorite. You know, I have my go-to which is kind of boring, which you're in Coronado or around Phoenix. Um, I've had some incredible rides, but the, you know, these, the hard rides that are memorable, you don't want to do again because yeah. <laughs> they're just punishing and they're not enjoyable. They're just, you're doing it to do it. Do you Whereas, watch Tour de France? Do you ever want to go do like the Tourmalet or something? I don't understand it. Just like car racing. I don't understand how the timing works and the, just doesn't seem fair. How, how are they so close after 21 days? So I think yeah. the whole thing's stupid. Well, it's because I think it's a beautiful sport and they figured out a way to wreck it with like declaring a winner. Well, it's like you say, right? They're just back in the pack, not not wasting their energy out in front, back in the pack for most of it yeah. and just spend super little no, time. But it's already it. narrowed down to a certain few before the, whoever put in the most time and every team picks their, their king. I just yeah, don't exactly. like the whole, I love the sport, hate the whole idea of a winner. Understood. Uh, and you said no favorites, but favorite Coronado restaurant that you go for your dumplings and your steaks? There's nothing on Coronado. <laughs> Not promoting anything. San Diego. We have to do better. We have to do better. I'm a big fan of uh, Hane Sushi and the Dumpling Inn. 
So it's easy to find me at one of those two places. Done. We're going to go there next time. Um, and then favorite, as you can see with my uh, banner behind me, favorite Star Wars character. Oh, no, I never was into it at all. Ever. I guess Chewbacca, just because of manscaping. I think yeah. it would be great for we'll my business. It. We'll yeah. take it. Can you do a Chewbacca? You know his voice? <laughs> Is that the right character? Uh, that was it. You nailed it. Right. Don't know it, but that was a good trade for Disney. Pay Lucas $2 billion and have made probably $10 billion off it already. Yep. Um, and help them launch Disney+. Plus. But anyway, uh, thanks, Howard. It's been fun. Um, we will talk to you soon and best of luck with everything. All right. Thanks for doing this. Crypto to the moon. See you. All right. Take care. Cheers. The Derivative is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures and options, visit cmegroup.com. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCMAlt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at RCMAlt.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.